So in terms of basic stuff, the first thing is to whatever degree you can, obviously a good GPA and good grades in your psychology specific courses, uh, that will help you make a strong applicant. Uh, getting into a PhD program is getting harder and harder over the years. Uh, so folks, the students who we see applying to our programs are, have stronger curriculum vitas, which I'll call CVs. Um, they have stronger CVs than a lot of uh, my colleagues and I had when we were applying. So the bar just keeps getting raised, just kind of like it has been for admission into uh, universities at the undergraduate level. So this is this is something probably already familiar to you. Um, so G, uh, a good GPA is an obvious important thing. And the thing is, it's your GPA, there's not a linear relationship between your GPA and your chances of getting in. It's more like a threshold model where as long as you're above uh, a general cutoff, you're probably going to be okay. Whereas if you're below that cutoff, it makes things harder. So um, in terms of cutoffs, uh, for, for getting straight into a PhD program, let's say if you're wanting to go from your bachelor's degree straight into a PhD, because the situation can be different if you're getting a master's, but from coming out of bachelor's, you know, the, the, the minimum you'd want is a 3.5, ideally. There are folks who get into graduate school who had, had a lower GPA than that, but that's kind of a good floor that you can try and aim for. When you get below that, some programs will look at your application with more hesitation. It's not, you know, and usually there's not one criteria that will eliminate you, but a collection of things that can scare uh, a, a doctoral application committee off. Um, but. GPA is one of those things that we do consider and that there is some research to suggest that GPA can be a fairly decent predictor of being able to succeed in graduate level work. Uh, so that's why we do consider it. Um, so if 3.5 is kind of uh, the, the, a comfortable minimum, what's even better is uh, a minimum of 3.7 or 3.8. So I think above a 3.7 or a 3.8, getting anything higher than that will not appreciably increase your chances of getting in. And again, this is just my perception, maybe other professors would disagree, but kind of when you're getting up there, we know you're smart. We know you know how to do well in the academic environment. So, you know, 3.85 or 3.9 or 4.0, uh, I, I don't know how much that's going to do for you. Um, so kind of to conclude this GPA section, 3.5 is a is kind of a comfortable minimum. If you can get a 3.7 or 3.8 or above, um, that's you're pretty rock you're pretty rock solid at that point. If you uh, don't get uh, an offer to uh, doctoral programs, it, it won't be because your GPA wasn't higher than a 3.7. It will be because of some other aspect of um, your application of your CV or how you interviewed. Uh, so the GPA won't be a problem. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, GRE scores, the graduate record exam. So uh, virtually all PhD programs, um, as well as PsyD programs, I would think, and then some master's programs, but not all, um, require a GRE score. And uh, the GRE, is a test that you can study for, and studying for it can significantly increase your score in the verbal area, uh, the math area, and the and the writing area. Maybe more of the the math and the and the uh, uh, vocabulary, or, or, or I'm blanking on my words, or the the verbal area. Um, those you can increase more. It's harder to like do some simple things and then your writing's automatically that much better. But there is, there are some rules of the road when it comes to how to go about that writing section that will impact uh, your score on that. Um, when I took the GRE, it was on like the 1600s point value. It's changed 
uh, since then, and so I'm less familiar with what the recommended minimums tend to be and all that. Um, but I will say this, that there are a few books that are published each year uh, that have uh, excellent advice about uh, the basics of getting into graduate school, including um, a book that details the uh, minimum and preferred GRE scores and GPAs of all the APA accredited uh, counseling psych and clinical psych PhD programs. So there's like uh, graduate education in psychology and the insider's guide and other guides. If you take a look uh, on my uh, professional web page, um, you'll see some of those books specifically named and I think I even provide links to them on Amazon. Just pick up uh, one of them, you don't probably need both, but one or maybe both of them used on Amazon. Um, it's a very worthwhile investment to read those, especially the introductory chapters, um, because you'll learn a lot in a small amount of time. It's a wonderful investment if you're serious about getting into doctoral level work, I think. Um, because you will you can learn about what specific requirements tend to want, uh, as well as some other rules of the road. Um, so when it comes to GRE, those books will have something to say about minimums you want to go for. Um, but what I, what I would have to offer around this is do take the time to study. Some people do a class, but you got to shell out money for that, and that might not work so well. What I found useful is um, I just got one of the like uh, the Kaplan's or Princeton Reviews uh, GRE preparation guide. Um, so you can even get one from the prior year. It'll be a lot cheaper and the content won't change. Uh, so if you're going to take it in 2015, get the 2014. It should work just as well. Um, and learn the tips and tricks because there are some definite tricks and kind of ways of going about taking those different sections of the test that if you follow them and, and learn them and implement them, you will score better, um, which, is, which is great. So you can raise your score. Um, even more than that is take as many practice tests as you can get your hands on. So a lot of times practice tests will be included with some of the books that you purchase or you can purchase them online or find them probably could find some free ones online, but I took like five or six uh, practice ones. And, you know, just getting exposure to the test and thinking in the ways they want you to think, that is some of the most useful practice to uh, get your scores up and kind of get you used to the format so that when you sit down, it feels familiar to you. It's not this weird thing that it makes it easier for you to be more anxious when it comes time to take the actual test. So taking practice tests is, is a wonderful way to do it. Um, in terms of like learning vocabulary words to try and boost your verbal score, that's hard and time consuming. I found that if you're gonna study some vocab words, they, uh, there are websites and I think the preparation books list the top 50 or top 100 most frequent advanced uh, GRE words. That's uh, if you're going to study lists, don't study more than 50 to 100 words. Uh, you know, familiarize yourself with those. When I did that, I saw probably about six of them uh, on the GRE test I happened to take. Um, so, you know, your your time is probably not better spent on learning more than 50 or 100 of those words really well. It's probably better spent on learning the tips and techniques and, and frankly relearning how to do all that math stuff that you probably don't do anymore because you have calculators. I mean, I rarely, I never do algebra by hand. A lot of the proportions and certainly geometry in my line of work, I don't, I don't really use that stuff. Um, so I've forgotten it all. I had to relearn it and I would have performed a lot more poorly on the test had I not taken the time to relearn what I learned in 6th, 7th and 8th grade and, and sophomore year of high school. It's, I think it's time well spent, particularly if you haven't been taking math classes as an undergraduate. Uh, so those are some of my thoughts about GRE. So at this point we've covered thoughts on GPA and GRE. 
Uh, so those, and the GRE also works on a threshold model like GPA. So when you give a, get above a certain range, you tend to be good to go. You tend to be looking okay in faculty members' eyes because you've kind of met that minimum threshold. Um, so don't, like with the GPA, don't obsess over, oh, I need to uh, bump myself up. Uh, you know, from this good score to this really, to this really, really good score. Like chances are, as long as you're above the, the key thresholds, particularly uh, the, the recommended GRE that's listed in the Graduate Education Psychology book, there's not much return on investment extra that you're gonna get from trying to strive higher. Your time is best spent doing other things like being more involved in research labs or clinical experiences or things like that. Um, so that's what I'll say about those two pieces. Another uh, piece is your, well, yeah, okay, is another piece is your letters of recommendation. Um, many programs either require two or three, I think most are three usually. And when it comes to, because again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking specifically about what will make you competitive for counseling psychology PhD programs. So some of this advice that I'm sharing will apply equally or to some degree to PsyD programs, which is another doctoral level degree that's very practice focused and less focused on research. Um, and a lot of this may apply to clinical psychology, PhD, or PsyD programs as well. Although there are some uh, slight differences that can be present between clinical and counseling psychology, which is something I might talk about in, uh, in another recording, since it's uh, not always clear what are the salient differences. But uh, yeah, so with that said, um, with these letters of recommendation, if you need three, you want to try and get one letter of recommendation at minimum from a person with a PhD, so a professor at your school, typically, uh, where you do your research assistantship with, when you're a research assistant working in a psychology lab, because that's typically the first introductory experience you have to research outside of just attending your classes. Uh, so you want the professor who's uh, in charge of the lab that you work in to write one of your letters. Sometimes what will happen is that graduate students will write the letter for you instead of professors. Uh, those are less valuable letters because uh, professors who are sitting on application committees want to want to hear the words of other professors with a PhD because those professors know what it takes to get a PhD because they've lived it themselves and they're usually helping younger students prepare for and succeed in that process. So uh, having the letter writer have a PhD degree when it comes to uh, talking about your research side, that's, that's preferred. But it's not the end of the world if the graduate student writes it. What will sometimes also happen is if this lab has graduate students as a part of it and you work mostly with those graduate students, um, a lot of times the graduate student will write the letter or help write most of the letter on behalf of the professor and then the professor will sign it as if the professor had written it. So the professor kind of endorses the truth of this because sometimes the professor hasn't spent really much face time with you so they have to totally rely on what the graduate student or the research lab coordinator saw in terms of the quality of your work and how you were as a professional in that environment. Um, so that, that can be pretty typical, that sort of ghost writing to happen. Um, so that's your, you want one letter of rec at minimum to be from that person who has seen your research capabilities. And I will kind of say more about the getting the research experience in, in a bit. Um, the second letter that you want is at minimum you want at least one letter from a person who has seen your clinical abilities or your helping skills, your interpersonal skills in action. Um, and this person, a lot of times depending on the setting, it might not be a PhD level person who is writing this letter just because a lot of those those kind of quasi-therapeutic experiences 
uh, internships or uh, extracurriculars or volunteer experience won't necessarily, uh, your supervisor won't necessarily be a PhD or PsyD level professional. It's more likely that they'll probably have a master's degree uh, or per, I guess potentially a bachelor's degree. But, but what's more important in that context is that they are a supervisor uh, of your work and they have seen you in action. And again, when I talk about building the clinical side of your skills, um, I'll kind of flesh that out more. Your third letter, um, you have some flexibility on because you've covered the research with one letter, you've covered the clinical with another letter. Um, and so uh, depending on the nature of the program you're applying for, if it's a more, if you get the sense that it's a, a, a research heavier program, ideally your third letter will be from a second uh, professor, uh, from a second research lab in which you've worked. Uh, so somebody else who has seen your research in action. So you'd end up with two research letters and one uh, therapy-esque helping skills letter of recommendation. Um, for some other people, it might be okay for your third letter to uh, come from a second clinical uh, person who's seen your clinical work. That could also be acceptable. Um, what is typically less valuable is a letter from a professor who you just took their class. Because unless it's a certain kind of classes, which I'll speak about in a bit, all that is is typically they've just seen, like, they'll be able to talk about, did you get good grades in the class? Did you show up on time? Did you have intelligent, reasonable things to say? Were you professional? So, like, they can speak to how you are as a student, but that, that tends to be less informative, in my opinion, uh, to folks who are looking at your letters of rec. Um, and, of course... A letter, the, a letter like that is less valuable when the professor knows you less and you were just one of their students, but you weren't, you didn't stand out in any particular way. Um, you know, and just because you got an A in the class does not mean, it does not mean that someone's going to be able to write a good letter of recommendation because when it comes to letters of rec, you want all three of your letters to be what we call a strong letter of recommendation where this person can say, I, I really believe in this person's capacity to become a good grad student. Um, because what you don't want is a, a, a mildly supportive letter or, eh, yeah, this person was good, but, you know, that sort of lukewarmness, uh, professors on search committees will hear that immediately. They can pick up that vibe from your letters if it's a lukewarm letter, and that can be the kiss of death. Because um, what that tells the application committee members is that, like, okay, this person really didn't necessarily seem to be that impressive, or this letter writer didn't seem to know this person well, so why did they ask this person to write a letter? They don't seem so prepared. Um, so that's, that's not a taste you want to leave application committees with. So you want strong letters of rec. So that's where having just one of your instructors write that letter can, can not be so helpful. It can, can kind of be hurt, hurting in some ways. Um, but I mentioned there can be some exceptions to this, and, and here's what it is. So sometimes, this, and this applies mostly for uh, like upper level like a junior, senior, 400 level, 500 level courses. Maybe it was a course where it was a small uh, number of enrolled students, so there was a lot of pers more personalized interaction, maybe more intimate, uh, personalized contact uh, with the professor in terms of dialogue and exchange of ideas and knowing each other intellectually. Um, that those letters could be stronger because they, they really kind of know you substantively from that rather than you were just one of their students. Um, when I did my PhD at Iowa State University and I, as a graduate student, taught a class that was a helping skills class where students learned how to use the basic micro skills like reflections of feeling, open questions, restatements, kind of the basic skills that therapists use 
when they work with clients, regardless of their theoretical orientation. Um, and that class was capped at 10 students, so I got to know those 10 students pretty well. It was a really hands-on class, and we were doing role plays and, and mock therapy all the time. So I really, I really saw a lot of them. It wasn't, you know, they could represent them well in how they wrote their papers and stuff, but it was, uh, I saw them practicing these therapy skills and using some of this stuff in this really rich manner. And so a letter from me um, could almost be uh, uh, one of those uh, clinical supervisor letters in, in the case of this class, because I was seeing those helping skills in action. So that actually could be a strong letter. But, but those are the exceptions. What, what we tend to see is that people just have their teachers write letters in and, and it doesn't help them so much. So bear those caveats in mind. Um, what else? Okay, so those, those are some pieces about the letters of rec. Um, I'll say a little bit more uh, about these as well.